Good morning. We are in 1 Samuel today. We're going to be looking at chapter 16. So 1 Samuel, chapter 16. We're going to look at verses 1 through 13. It's a, it's a lengthy section, but I need to read it all so that we can have the whole picture here. So we're in 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verses 1 through 13, and it says this. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you be, how long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have selected a king for myself among his sons. But Samuel said, How can I go? When Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to, this, to sacrifice to the Lord. You shall invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I designate to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the city came trembling to meet him and said, Do you come in peace? He said, In peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. He also consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they entered, he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the, Lord anoint the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abin Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Next, Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Thus, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen this. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are these all the children? And he said, uh, There remains yet the youngest, and behold, he is tending the sheep. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose and went to Ramah. So, in lieu of a, an introduction today, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background, because this is, this is a lot to, to deal with in one sitting. So this is what's happening so far in 1 Samuel. The people of Israel, at some point, they just decided that they wanted a king, and they wanted to be just like the other nations, so they wanted a king. They wanted a man to lead them. They wanted a king they could see and touch, and ultimately, what they were doing by demanding a, a, a human king was that they were rejecting God as their king. Samuel, of course, warned them against this, and he told them that this would bring unwanted consequences for them, but the people disregarded the warning and continued to demand a king. So the Lord gave them Saul. Unfortunately, after some time, Saul failed to fully obey God's commands. And ultimately, Saul's problem was disobedience to the Lord. He, he, he was rebelling against the Lord by, by not obeying fully what he was told to do. So in a sense, he was not only rebelling, he was also rejecting God. And as a consequence of this rejection by Saul, in 1 Samuel 15, 28, Samuel says to Saul, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor, who is better than you. So now, this is where we are. Samuel 
has told Saul, you're out. You have been rejected. And now um, there's going to be a new king. And this is where we are. So we begin in verse 1, where the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? So in the previous chapters of this book, we have been learning that contrary to what anyone would expect, Saul was actually a very humble man, despite of being physically impressive. Saul was a tall, strong, and handsome man. And what we think about this is, is how many times do we see men and women who, knowing that they are good looking, uh, they speak and behave as, the, as if they were superior to everyone else, as if they were God's ultimate gift to humanity, just because they know that they are pleasing to the eyes. But Saul was not like that. Saul was a humble man, and he was a likable man, and Samuel loved him. Samuel had affection for Saul. Unfortunately, this kingship that, that, that looked so promising came crashing down in flames. Saul had rejected the word of God, and now God had rejected Saul. And for this reason, now Samuel is grieving over Saul's rebellion and rejection. He's, he's saddened by this situation. And perhaps Samuel, the prophet, was also worried that Israel would fall apart as a result of Saul's sin. Because after all, the people usually follow the steps of their leaders. So if there is not a leader in place, this could spiral out of control, and he would bring the whole nation down with him. But whatever the cause of Samuel's grief, God had already made a decision. The Lord had chosen another man to be the king of Israel, and Samuel had absolutely no time to waste grieving over a man who had already been rejected by God, which in this case is Saul. So the Lord commands him, fill your horn with oil and go, and I will send you to, the, uh, to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have selected a king for myself among his sons. So here this phrase, I have selected a king for myself, is conveying the same idea that Genesis 22 verse 8 was, was conveying when Abraham said to Isaac, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So here there are two things that I want us to reflect upon this morning. The first one is that God is a merciful and gracious God. This short phrase reminds us that God never leaves or forsakes his people. He never leaves us hanging. He never leaves us to our own devices. He never leaves us out to dry. Instead, God always provides what is best for his children. That's what I want you to remember from just this section. God always provides what is best for us. It's not what we want. It's what is best. He knows what is best. So in this case, God will provide his people with new leadership, with a new opportunity, with a new beginning. He's going to provide them a new king. And this brings us to our second reflection of the morning, it is, is, is that God is sovereign. Paul tells us in Romans 13, verse 1, that there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. So... What we see here in 1 Samuel is what Paul is speaking about in Romans 13, that all leaders, without exception, whether they're good or bad, at home, at church, school, work, government, anywhere that there's a leader, all leaders, good or bad, are appointed by God himself. Now, in contrast to Saul, God never loses control of his kingdom. He never loses control over his creation, over his emotions. He's always very much in charge. So regardless of the circumstances, God is always in absolute control of every situation, even what's happening today in Israel. Things are dire over there, things are bad, but he is still in control. You need to remember that. God is faithful, and he's reliable, and he will accomplish his purpose. Now, we may not agree, with how he does things, because we don't understand, and he doesn't owe us an explanation, but what we can be certain of is that there is a purpose, and it will be accomplished, and this purpose is perfect. Going back to our section here, Samuel says in verse 2, 
how can I go? When Saul, he, when Saul hears of it, he will kill me. So what we have here is there are, there are two things at play here. First, even though God had rejected Saul, Saul was still the most powerful man in Israel. He was still the king. He was still in charge of the military. And the second thing that we have here is that everyone knows that Samuel is a prophet from God. He's a servant of God. So Samuel is what we would call a kingmaker. And he is also a judge. So his profile, his visibility around the kingdom is very high. Everybody knows who Samuel is. So it is reasonable to believe that Saul would receive regular updates about Samuel's whereabouts. He wants to know what Samuel is doing at all times. Remember, he's a servant of God. He's a prophet. So Samuel is afraid that Saul would kill him if he learned that Samuel was in Bethlehem to anoint a new king, because this would be an act of rebellion. This would be mutiny. So he's afraid for his life. So God gives Samuel an additional task that would help him conceal the main purpose of his trip to Bethlehem and would prevent any suspicions. Now, the Lord is not lying here. He's just not disclosing the whole truth. It's, it, it's a very different thing. There are some information that we do not have. So the Lord is giving us part of the information. Samuel has a rest, which is a secret. And that's what's happening here. So the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And then he says, you shall invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I designate to you. So this phrase, I will show you what you shall do. It reminds us of Exodus chapter 4 and verse 15, where the Lord said to Moses, I will teach you what you are to do. It also reminds us of Act 9, verse 6, where Jesus said to Saul of Tarsus, Get up and enter the city, and it will, to it, it will be told you what you must do. So these three statements make it abundantly clear, again, that God is indeed the sovereign ruler of the universe who unilaterally decides what, who, when, where, and how of absolutely everything that happens in the universe. And in this particular case, we see that it is God who decides who is placed in a position of authority. Where are you placed? What city were you were born? What family you come from? Everything is decided by God, and this is shown here in this very uh, small verse. Then in verse 4, Samuel says, Samuel does what the Lord said, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the city came trembling to meet him and said, do you come in peace? As I mentioned before, everyone knew that Samuel was a prophet from God. So it is reasonable for them to assume, for the elders to assume, that when, when, when they see him coming into Bethlehem, they may have thought that there was a problem. This is a serious problem. The prophet from God is coming to town. And... Most likely, he's going to pronounce judgment over us. That's what he's doing. He's also a judge. So the elders might have assumed he's, he's here to deal with a serious problem. This, this, this is going to be bad. So that's why they ask, do you come in peace? Is, did we do anything? I mean, like, is there a problem here? And Samuel gives them a friendly answer that put their fears to rest. And he says in verse 5, in peace, relax. It's, it's a good thing that I am here. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. He also consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So here what we need to know is that consecration was a ceremonial cleansing. This is a Levitical ritual that was meant to spiritually cleanse the person in order to enter the sphere of the sacred in order to come into the presence of God. So the, uh, uh, this ceremony normally involved uh, bathing and changing into uh, clean clothes, abstaining from marital relations, and avoiding anything that is dead or, or uh, unclean, because they're going to go into the presence of God. They need to be spiritually clean. They're going to go worship. 
So Samuel is asking the elders to worship the Lord with him. And for that, they need to go and consecrate themselves to become spiritually clean. And then at the at this same time, Samuel is going to consecrate Jesse and his sons. Then verse 6 says, When they entered, he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So just like Saul, Eliab must have been a tall, strong, and handsome man. And Samuel clearly is impressed by Eliab's appearance. In fact, Samuel is so impressed that he is convinced that this was the Lord's anointed. There cannot be anyone else. This is the guy. This is our guy. But the Lord said to Samuel in verse 7, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Samuel here made a critical mistake. He made a judgment based on appearance, based on what he thought was attractive, based on what he thought was desirable, based on, 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 on what he found valuable. And after all, you need to remember, Samuel, yes, he is a servant of God. He is a prophet of God. But at the end of the day, Samuel is human, just like you and I. And we value things that we can see, things like beauty and height and strength and body shape, education, ability, charisma, wealth, all these things that are visible to us, we, we value them. We have competitions for see who's the prettiest woman in the universe, who's the strongest man in the universe, who's the this, who's the that. We have awards for that. This is what we value as human beings. And just like Samuel here, Sometimes, and I dare say most of the time, we assume that God also finds these visible characteristics valuable. We, we, we tend to think that God is impressed by our professional or educational or athletic achievements. But God makes, makes it clear here to Samuel and to us today that his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. God is decisively and infinitely different than us. He's different in every possible way. God does not value the same things that we do. He says, God does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. As I was saying, men are impressed by the things that we see with our eyes, but God is not impressed or much concerned about our outward appearance. God is concerned about the contents of our hearts. And only God has the ability to look and to judge into the contents of a person's heart. Only God can see the thoughts in our minds, the emotions of our hearts, and the intentions of our wills. And that statement should bring us great comfort, but also great concern. Because there is no lying to God. There is no cheating God. He knows exactly what we're thinking. He knows exactly what we're feeling. And he knows exactly what we're intending. Jesus says in Luke chapter 16, verse 15, God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. Now, I need to let you know that this verse is not saying that God is opposed to beauty or height or strength or body shape or education or your ability or your charisma, your wealth. None of those things. God is not opposed to those. We need to remember that after all, all those things are a gift that come from his hand. He bestows those upon his children. But the problem is that God is not really concerned about these things. That's not really what matters to him. He's concerned about what's in our hearts. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Our mouth is a window into our heart. 
because our mouth speaks of that which fills our hearts. In other words, what I'm, what I'm saying is this. All of us, we're going to think, we're going to act, and we're going to uh, speak according to what we believe, according to what we value, according to what we worship. This is why it is so important, and I have said it many times, and I know it sounds repetitive, but it is important for us to remember this. This is why this is, it is so important to fill our hearts and our minds with the inerrant word of God so that our life may be a reflection of God's light and so that our lives may be a witness to all of those who are around us. If we don't have the word of God in our hearts, it is going to show in the way we speak, in the thoughts that we have, in the things that we do. There is no other way. That's why it is so important to be in the Word. Verses 8 through 10. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Next, Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Thus, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen this. So one by one, all of Jesse's seven sons marched before Samuel, but none of them had been chosen because none of them had the right kind of heart. This must have been very confusing to Samuel because God said that he had chosen a king from Jesse's family, Jesse's sons. And now what we have here is that all seven of the, of the sons have marched in front of him, and the Lord has rejected every single one of them. So if you're in Samuel's position, you could have been thinking, is there a problem here? All the children have passed by, and the Lord rejected all of them. Did God misspeak? Did, did, he, did he make a mistake here? I mean, what, what is happening? Well, of course not. God doesn't make mistakes. God no, never lies. So there has to be another answer. And the answer is in verse 11. Samuel said to Jesse, okay, are, are these all the children? And he said, well, there remains the, yet the youngest. And behold, he's tending the sheep. And then Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. So, as I said, God does not make any mistakes. Jesse had an eighth son, the youngest of them. Here the Hebrew word hakatan, translated as the youngest, could also be translated as the smallest. Well, there's the smallest of my kids, but he's out there with the sheep. So it is possible that this, is, this word is, is, is giving a description, it's a deliberate description, making a contrast with Eliab, the, the oldest brother, but also possibly with Saul. Remember, Saul is very tall, strong and handsome, but this Hakatan is, is the smallest, so he's not as big. So that might be a contrast that has been made. Now, a question that we could ask here is, why? Did Jesse omit to bring his youngest son to meet Samuel? I mean, after all, they know that Samuel wants to see them. He says, I need you to bring your children. Why would you leave the youngest out? It doesn't really make sense. Is it perhaps because Jesse assumed that his tallest, strongest, and most handsome son, Eliab, would be the chosen one? I mean, this, this guy is my guy. Well, I don't know. I need to bring the youngest, the, the smallest here. Could it be that Jesse assumed that the smallest child had absolutely no chance for anything, so we don't even want to bother bringing him? Or is it possible that Jesse also made a judgment based on what he could see, on what he, what he could uh, 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 find valuable like Samuel did? We can only speculate because the text doesn't say, but this is a possibility, and if that was the case, well, they were both wrong. The smallest son then is out in the field tending the sheep, and Samuel says, you need to bring him immediately because I cannot complete my mission without him being here in my presence. So we're here is another proof 
in this very inconspicuous verse of how God is sovereign over anything. God does not improvise. He has always a plan and a purpose, and that purpose cannot be thwarted. This is also further proof that his ways are not our ways. In this verse, we can see how the Lord does not follow our human logic. He does not conform to our protocols. He does not act according to our social conventions. God does what he does regardless of what we think or have customs in place uh, uh, about. So God is not bound by our customs or traditions, much less to the traditions of the day. God was not going to choose Eliab just because it was customary that the firstborn was the one that received everything. In fact, this is not the first time that the Lord chooses the youngest sibling over the firstborn. God chose Abel over Cain, Isaac over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau, Joseph over all of his older brothers, Ephraim over Manasseh, and Moses over Aaron. And I may be forgetting about other examples, but these are just a few examples of the youngest being chosen over the oldest, when the customary thing was that the oldest got all the package. And he's about to do the same thing with Jesse's youngest son, who at the moment, he said, was standing the sheep, which in this case, he's, he's a shepherd. So in those days, shepherding was assigned to younger sons our hirelings and slaves. This, this was becoming more and more, as, as, as they were uh, getting away from agriculture and were, were becoming more, uh, 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 tending more into cattle and, 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 and these kinds of uh, activities, shepherding was now assigned to younger sons, hirelings and slaves. And in some cases, like in Egypt, they looked down on shepherds. So this was not the most glamorous activity to have, but that's where, that's where the youngest of Jesse is, tending to the sheep. Now, just as a recap, the shepherds were in charge of leading the sheep to the pastures and to the water. All right? They were in charge of taking them to, to feed, and they had to go from one place to another, and, he, and the shepherd needed to know where the grass was good and, and, and where you know, there was water and it was clean water. So he was making sure that the sheep were taken care of you know, their, their most basic needs. But, but he also was in charge of protecting the sheep from predators. I mean, at that time, as far as I understand, there were lions and bears in that area, which there are not anymore, but, but there were. So there are predators out there that are wanting to take the sheep and the shepherd needed to be always on watch, making sure that these uh, animals don't get eaten. And of course, there has always been people that steal, robbers, and the shepherd was also in charge of keeping the sheep from being stolen. So. All of these activities could be done, of protecting, could be done in the open or in the sheepfolds. And if you remember Dan's lesson we were talking about when, when the, the, the sheep going to the sheepfold, the shepherd slept at the entrance, keeping, keeping guard you know, of who goes in and who goes out. So there's a lot of responsibility that the shepherd had. And as they're, if, he, if he's bringing the sheep uh, uh, to the sheepfold, he counts how many are there, making sure that all of them is accounted for. And there, if there's not a sheep, if someone is missing, he needs to go now and find it and bring it. And sometimes if the sheep was out there in the field with a broken leg or wounded, the shepherd had to pick it up and bring it to the sheepfold. So there's a lot of things involved in shepherding than just watching the sheep. So the shepherd took care of all their needs, period. And this is what this uh, uh, young boy is doing. So why am I saying all this? Well, because this is not an insignificant detail. This is a very well-defined plan that we see here. Listen to what the Lord said in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now, these words are spoken to Jeremiah, but this is what's unfolding here with David as well. Just like Jeremiah, David was chosen to serve God even before he was born. So it was not an accident, it was not a coincidence that David was a shepherd, that David was the youngest in his family, that he was born in Bethlehem. There's 
all, there's a purpose for all of this. So it was all part of God's plan for his people and for David. And it was out on those fields alone with the sheep that God was preparing a lowly shepherd from the house of Jesse, born in Bethlehem, to become the king of Israel. That's why I'm giving you these details. It is very important. And I believe that one of the lessons that we learn from this is to not look down upon the circumstances in which the Lord has placed us. Perhaps, for my youth group, perhaps you're not in the starting lineup of your football team. Perhaps you're not the prima ballerina of your dance company. Uh, maybe that promotion that you have been waiting for has not yet come. Um, you might still be seeking or waiting to meet the love of your life, whatever your situation may be. You need to be encouraged because God has not forgotten you. God has not abandoned you. God has placed you where you are for a reason. He is preparing each and every one of us where we are for something. And all we need to do is trust him. We need to obey him. And we just need to be patient. Mike Black always tells me, your job is to sit and wait. Sit and wait. The game will come to you. And that's what we need to do. Sit and wait. Sooner or later, God is going to reveal his plan for each and every one of us. Because that's the way the, work, the, the Lord works. We see that in the life of David. This should be an encouragement to all of us. Now back in our text... Verse 12 says, so he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, arise, I anoint him, for this is he. Now this, interestingly enough, this is the, the first of only two occasions in which David is going to have direct contact with Samuel. The next time they will be in each other's presence is going to be in chapter 19, verse 18 of this book. But here now, this is the first time that they are meeting. And this Hebrew adjective, admoni, is translated as ruddy or ruddy, something like that, R-U-D-D-Y. And it's, uh, it's the same adjective that is used to describe Esau at his birth in Genesis 25. And this is significant because in the ancient Near East, having red hair or brownish red hair with fair skin was considered a sign of exceptional beauty. So. As I was saying, there are no coincidences in, in, in the scriptures. There's a plan, a purpose for everything. David is being described here as an exceptionally handsome man. And he may not have been very tall, but he was very handsome. So that made up for something. And yet, his physical features are irrelevant. This is just a, a, a detail that is really not that important because the point here is not that he's handsome. The point here is not that, um, that David, was, David was chosen by his looks. That's not what he was chosen for. He was chosen because of his heart. Acts 13, 22, Luke tells us that David had a desire to search after God's own heart. David had a genuine and sincere love for God, and that is why the Lord tells Samuel at the end of verse 12, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. This is my guy. Verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and went to Ramah. This, this verse here is the first time that David is mentioned by name in this book. And the name of David means beloved by God. Again, nothing is a coincidence. Everything is part of the plan. His name given way before uh, uh, Samuel was going to meet him was beloved by God. And... Now, he's been anointed with oil. And this is uh, being anointing with, anointed with oil was a symbolic act that was done for the purpose of setting apart priests. It could be setting apart kings, 
prophets, and in some uh, cases even objects set apart for, the, for God's use. This ceremony was a, a sign of official appointment to office. It was a symbol of God's power over, over them. So it signified, as I was saying, that this individual or this object was consecrated for God's use. That's what anointing uh, uh, is. And what we see here is that David is now being set apart. He's been consecrated for God's use. And he's, he's, it, it, this happens in front of his brothers. Now, the text doesn't say anything in reference to why there were witnesses in, in this anointing or what was the purpose for the witnesses to be there, but it is possible that David's anointment happened in front of his brothers because perhaps the family would serve as a future witness of how God indeed had chosen David to take over the kingdom. There's also the possibility that Jesse and his sons might have thought that this anointing that was happening was done so that David could become a, a student of Samuel, because Samuel used to have a, a school. So they might have thought, well, he's just taking him under his, his wing as a, as, a, as a student. But most likely is that Samuel was the only one in the room that knew exactly what was happening. Um, and the reason I say that this is the most likely outcome is that, that, that um, we are told that Samuel was worried that Saul would have him killed for treason. So I think that it would doubt, be doubtful that Samuel would disclose, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you uh, there's going to be a king among your children. I, I don't think that he would have done that because, you know, that loose uh, lips uh, sink ships. So most likely, Samuel was the only one that knew what was happening. Now, Going back to the anointment, this anointment that David was experiencing was more than symbol symbolic because the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. So you see what's happening here is that Samuel had anointed David outwardly with oil, but God was anointing David inwardly. So this constitutes a change. This is a turning point in his, Israel's history, things are going to change from now on, radically. And as I mentioned before, believers in the Old Testament were not indwelled permanently by the Holy Spirit, like we are now in the New Testament. Instead, what happened in the Old Testament was the, that the Holy Spirit came and went from people in order to help them accomplish a specific task. For example, the Spirit came to Saul twice for different purposes. And if you remember in the book of Judges, the Spirit also comes to Samson to carry out specific tasks three times to Samson. So this is going to be also true of David. The Holy Spirit did not permanently indwell David. He just came upon him for a time, however long that time might have been, to give him the power and the ability to accomplish the special task that God had given him. David had been chosen by God to become king of Israel, and now God was giving him, was equipping him with what he needed to fulfill this difficult task. One might think that if I was empowered by the Holy Spirit, it would be my life much easier. But all believers here can attest that that's not the case. We are indwelled by the Holy Spirit and life is not easier. David will go on to face difficult challenges through his life, and so will we, as many of us can witness. So Acts 14, 22 says, through many afflictions, we must enter the kingdom of God. Trials, difficulty, and pain are inevitable for the believer, but we must be encouraged by the fact that the Lord is there with us in the darkest, most difficult and painful times. David will write about this in one of the Psalms. God is going to be there with us in the midst of the hardest of challenges. And here, he says, now he says, I say, that just like God was with David, God is with us, and God will be with us. So, this is the end of the lesson, and I want you to be encouraged by the fact that our God is perfect and is holy and He's just. He's infinitely wise, merciful, 
and generous. He knows what we're going through. He knows what we need. He knows what we want. And the Lord acts accordingly, especially for those of us who are suffering. It is very easy, I understand, to say those things when there's nothing wrong happening in your life. But when we look at the life of David, we need to remember that God was indeed with him in the darkest of the moments. So God is not like us. His ways are not our ways. And that's why God is able to love and to forgive in a way that we are unable to. When we are wounded, when we are hurt, when we are wrong, when we are offended, we want retribution, we want revenge, and we want it quick. And sometimes we're very quick to, to do so, but the Lord is not quick to take revenge. The Lord is loving and patient. And you have seen it, I hope, throughout our lives, how the Lord has been patient through all our mistakes, through all our wrongings. God forgives, and there is not a sin that is too big that he cannot forgive because he is not like us. So that must be an encouragement for us. God does not require perfect obedience. That's not what was been asked from Saul. God requires sincere obedience. Later on, we're going to see how David messes up big time. But he was forgiven because his love for the Lord was sincere. It was not perfect. It was sincere. Like Peter. We we're just reminded of Peter. Three times he denied the Lord, and yet he did love him. And God restored him to the service. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the blessing that it is to know that you are not like us. You're perfect in every way. You're merciful and just and loving and gracious. So, Lord, we thank you for that. We ask for forgiveness because we are sinful and we're forgetful and we do things and say and, and think things that we ought not to. But, Lord, um, you can look into our hearts and see that we, we love you and we want to serve you and we want to obey you. But we're weak and we need you, Lord. So would you please... Help us to do that. Help us to walk in a manner that is um, um, honoring to you. Keep us away from the things that distract us from idols and, and temptations that we may be able to serve you, serve your people. We thank you, Lord, for your word that brings us so much encouragement. We thank you for uh, David's example for us that gives us encouragement to know that you are here, that you're in charge, and there's, uh, there's no one else but you, Lord. So. So we look, look to you for everything, Father. We thank you for your son who died on the cross for our sins, and um, through his sacrifice, we, we have life. We thank you, Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.